This is so awesome. Cosgrove decks me. I mean, he socks me so hard, I end up flat on my back. Like a tipped-over turtle. Minus the kicking legs. I'm down for the count. Well, I would be if Cosgrove could count. He's about as good at math as he is at reading. Lying on the ground, staring up at the sky with parking lot gravel in my hair, I feel that I have finally arrived. Stevie Cosgrove punched me just like I was a regular, normal kid. He didn't call me Gimp or Crip or Wheelie McFeely. He just slugged me in the gut and laughed hysterically when I toppled backward. He even kicked my wheelchair off to the side so I'd look more like an average loser sprawled out on the black asphalt. This is progress. The world just became a little better place. I'm not the kid in the wheelchair anymore, and not just because Stevie knocked me out of it. I feel normal, and normal feels absolutely amazing. You see, once you've been labeled a special needs kid, being ordinary... Even if it's being ordinary, sprawled out flat on your back, is the most incredible feeling in the world. So thank you, Stevie Crosgrove. I can see why you, sir, are the champ. You bully without regard to race, religion, creed, national origin, or physical abilities. You are an equal opportunity tormentor. Fortunately, my two best friends, Pierce and Gaynor, come along and help me back into my chair. They're both super cool. Good peeps. Hey, guys, I say. Did I beat the count? I want a rematch. I was robbed. Where's Cosgrove? Let me at him. Yo, Adrian! We did it, Adrian! Yeah, I'm a huge Rocky fan. I liked Real Steel, too, and the champ. Are you okay, Jamie? asks Pierce. Never better. Was that great or what? Seriously, come on, Jamie, quit goofing around. I'm fine, I say. Nothing is broken that wasn't broken before. You're sure? Positive. I wouldn't lie to you guys. We head into school. Pierce and Gaynor don't grab hold of the chair's handles to push me like I'm a baby in a stroller. They just walk beside me, like wingmen. Like I'm a normal bud. I think somebody once said that friends are the family we choose. You don't know how lucky I am that Pierce and Gaynor chose me. These two guys are awesome. The best. Chapter 5 And now the good stuff. Take a look at my picture in the PDF. I know what you're thinking. Zac Efron without the hot legs. Okay, maybe not, but I do have a pretty good set of guns. Check out my bulging biceps. Those mosquito bite bumps on my arms there. Yeah, girls look at me and think, Ooh, take me to the mall or the movies or Taco Bell. They probably figure we can park in the handicap space close to the doors. Now I'm guessing you go to school too, so you know what that's like. All the bad stuff, like rubbery pizza in the cafeteria, and pop quizzes and social studies. And let's not even get into that sawdusty stuff the janitor sprinkles over the occasional puke puddle. So, let me just tell you the good parts about my school. There's cold chocolate milk in the cafeteria, every day. And of course, I've got my two best buds. You already met them, Pierce and Gaynor. Pierce is a total brainiac. He can tell you everything you ever wanted to know, like how you mark a baseball scorecard with a backward K for a called third strike, and a forward K if the batter strikes out swinging. Gaynor is a little more edgy, a little more out there, if you know what I mean. He actually has tattoos and a nose ring. I don't think I'll ever get a tattoo. With my luck, the guy working the ink needle would get the hiccups and I'd end up with a squiggly butterfly instead of a fire-breathing dragon. My friends are both excellent squatters. When I started using the chair, the whole world seemed to grow three feet taller and everybody was always looking down on me. Literally. But not Gaynor and Pierce. If we're just hanging out... They'll both hunker down into a deep knee bend or find something to sit on, so we're all talking eye to eye. They're not just thinking about themselves, they're thinking about me, too. Anyway, another good thing about my school. 
the science lab. If you stare out the third window just the right way, you'll get an excellent view of the ocean and the beach. Well, it's only a tiny sliver, but if you squint real hard, you can see the surf and my Uncle Frankie's diner. Then there's this frizzy-haired girl who's in a couple of my classes. She's definitely another good thing about school. She laughed once in math class when I cracked the joke about parallel lines. When all those parallel lines finally meet in infinity, do they throw a party? The frizzy-haired girl has a very bubbly laugh. She's also extremely cute. But who am I kidding? She probably doesn't even know I exist. I'm just the jokester sitting in the back of the classroom. Other than that, I'm totally invisible to her. Which reminds me of this awful joke, what I call a groaner, that I read in one of my giant jokalopedias. A nurse goes into a doctor's office and says, Doctor, there's a man out here who thinks he's invisible. I'm busy, says the doctor. Tell him I can't see him right now. Pretty corny, huh? But I figure the frizzy-haired girl feels the same way about me, that I'm invisible. I guess all the cute girls do. I also have a feeling they always will. Chapter 6. My After School Special. The final bell rings at school and I'm off like a shot. I'm the first one out of the building every afternoon. I zip down the sidewalk and head to my Uncle Frankie's diner. I love spending time with Frankie. He owns the oldest diner in the whole New York metropolitan area. It's so old, I think when it opened, Burger King was still a prince. Even the jukebox plays nothing but oldies, mostly doo-wop tunes from the 1950s and 60s. Uncle Frankie isn't just the owner, he's also the head chef. And get this, he's the former yo-yo champion of all of Brooklyn, a place famous for its yo-yos. Uncle Frankie is always doing yo-yo tricks, even when he's working the grill. He can hop the fence, walk the dog, loop the loop, and go around the world with one hand while flipping griddle cakes and two eggs over easy with the other. So, how was school today, Jamie? He asks once I'm parked in the kitchen. Not bad. I took out a bully today. Really? Yeah, he was picking on this sixth grader, so I pulled a Chuck Norris and did what needed to be done. You stood up for this other kid? Well, I didn't exactly stand. You know what I mean. Yeah, I do. Uncle Frankie puts down his yo-yo and nods proudly. You did good, Jamie. Well, you know what Kevin James says in mock -op. If Frankie holds up a hand. No joke, kiddo. I'm proud of you. Seriously proud. Thanks. I'm sort of blushing when I say it. Neither one of us says anything else for a while. The only sound in the kitchen is grease sputtering on the grill and some plates clanking behind us. I don't do so well with long, thoughtful pauses or total quiet. Gives me a little too much time to think about my situation and how absolutely alone I sometimes feel. So I rev up my motor mouth. Oh, and this morning, on my way to school, I wiped out a whole bunch of zombies, rolled over them too. I may never get all the green slime out of my tire treads. Is that so? says Uncle Frankie, shaking his head and smiling. Zombies? Yep, I say. All in all, it was just your average ho-hum kind of day. So, Jamie, you ever think about writing down your wacky stories so you can tell them to people in a comedy club or something? I shrug. Mm, sometimes, maybe. Not really. You should. You crack me up, kiddo. You'd crack up other people, too. Trust me on this one. I know a little something about show business. Because you were a yo-yo champion? Exactly. I've been on the big stage, and it's very cool. So, as they say, maybe in Iowa or Nebraska, the seed was planted. Chapter 7. There's no place like home. If there were, the authorities would shut it down. After a healthy after-school snack of french fries and ketchup, they're both technically vegetables, 
It's time to leave the diner and head for home, a little place I call Smileyville. I moved to Long Beach when my mother's sister, we'll call her Aunt Smiley, adopted me. Yes, I wish my father's brother Uncle Frankie had adopted me, but the judge sent me to Smileyville instead. I'm not so sure that my mother's sister was all that excited about adding me to her family. Have you ever seen one of those adopt-a-highway signs on the interstate? I think that would have been her first choice. The Smileys are the most clueless, absent-minded people you'll ever meet. They hardly notice I'm around, which basically works in my favor because I can sneak out pretty easily. But the most important thing about my adoptive family is that I call them the Smileys because they never, ever smile. You could bring home ice cream and cupcakes and these people would still pout. You could pop open a crate full of adorable tail-wagging puppies, and they wouldn't even crack a grin. In fact, they already have a dog. I call him Old Smiler. Look up hangdog expression in the dictionary, and you'll see his face. There's only one good thing about being adopted by a family that never, ever smiles. They're the perfect test audience for my jokes. If I can make these people laugh, I'm pretty sure I can make anybody laugh. Oh, there's one tiny thing that makes living in Smileyville even worse. Yep, it's time for another curveball. Chapter 8 With brothers like this, who needs enemies? Meet my brand new big brother. And by big, I mean huge. You are correct. It's Stevie Cosgrove, the same bully who made my day by knocking me out of my wheelchair. Officially, he is now my adoptive brother, because Aunt Smiley is Stevie's mom. As you might imagine, living with my new adoptive brother is a lot less Brady Bunch and much more Harry Potter. Stevie Cosgrove is my very own somewhat demented Dudley Dursley. If Dudley had muscles and serious B.O. issues, and knew how to jam people's heads down toilets to give them a swirly. Yes, Stevie Cosgrove makes my new home a living hell, except for the heat. My new bedroom is so cold. Last night, I saw a spider in the corner standing on one leg. Sorry, those are David Letterman jokes, and David Letterman is one of my idols. Chapter 9 Brainstorming Every night after dinner, which is usually something like tuna noodle casserole made with cream of wallpaper soup, I escape to the privacy of my bedroom. Actually, it used to be the garage, which probably explains why it's never what you might call warm or toasty. That's where we keep all the crap with wheels, Stevie said the day I moved in. The lawnmower, the snowblower, and you. In fairness, Uncle Smiley cleaned the place out. He even put rugs over all the oil and antifreeze spotches on the floor. The cold concrete floor. On the plus side, I'm the only kid I know with a genuine weed whacker hanging on his wall. My bedroom is also where I keep my massive collection of joke books and notebooks. Whenever I have an idea for a comic sketch or a bit, I roll in here, grab a notebook and a pen, and go to work. For instance, last night the Smileys were watching the National Geographic movie March of the Penguins. It's their kind of movie. Lots of ice, blizzards, gale force winds, and those cute little penguins everywhere. By the way, did you know that penguins mate for life? Then again, they all look the same, so how do they even know their girlfriend is really their girlfriend? See, this is what I do. I brainstorm every silly angle I can think of on a subject jot it all down, no judgments allowed during brainstorming, and then try to work it into a bit. Maybe I could do a riff on this penguin stand-up comic I pretend I know. Poor guy, all he can tell are black and white jokes. What's black and white, and black and white, and black and white? A nun in a revolving door? Or me in a revolving door? Or my mother in a... I'm working away, thinking about what Uncle Frankie said, the seed he planted, when all of a sudden there's this terrible banging on my bedroom door. 
What you doing in there, Jamie? It's Stevie Cosgrove, my adoptive brother. My escape into my imaginary world is cut short by his very real pounding and howling. I don't feel so funny when Stevie's knocking on my bedroom door. To be honest, I feel trapped, which I guess I kind of am. Chapter 10 It's a small beach after all. The next day, thank goodness, is Saturday. To once again quote the great Homer Simpson, Woo-hoo! Time to roll up the garage door, say goodbye to Smileyville, and breeze down to the Long Beach Boardwalk, which is about a mile shorter than the Long Beach that Long Beach is named after. Two and a quarter miles. Uncle Frankie tells me it was built back in 1914, with the help of elephants. Yep, it's already in one of my notebooks. A bit about elephants trying to figure out how to hold a hammer, since they don't have any thumbs. Then I say, no one really cared how long it took for the elephants to hammer in a nail. They worked for peanuts. Okay, that one still needs a little tweaking. I'll work on it. What I like best about the beach and boardwalk is all the different kinds of people I see. Russian grandmas in headscarves, Hispanic families eating rainbow-colored snow cones, Hasidic men with curly side locks and big hats, Koreans and Chinese smiling in the sunshine, Italians with lots of back hair, Irish with lots of freckles, every place the Italians have hair. Maybe they should call this United Nations Beach. Okay, I'm pulling out my notebook to jot this down. It could be a whole new bit for my act. Sand, sun, and surf, the great equalizers. Proof that people everywhere can get along in peace and harmony, as long as none of them play their music too loud, and everybody remembers to use sunblock. On United Nations Beach, there are no borders, just blankets. And everybody looks basically the same in a bathing suit, especially old guys in Speedos. They all look ridiculous. But wait, this is bigger than every country in the world. I see fat people, skinny people, workout freaks, hipsters, bankers. Who else would wear a suit to the beach? I see zombies playing frisbee with penguins, penguins wearing black and white bikinis. What if life really were a beach? What if the sun shone every day and all you had to do all day was splash in the surf, boogie board, apply sunblock, and spear a couple of sand crabs for dinner? Maybe this is the secret to world peace. Make everybody everywhere move to the nearest beach. There would be no more wars, just a few small action figure skirmishes around the sandcastles. Of course, I do have one absolutely horrible fear about the beach. Keep listening if you dare. Chapter 11 Sand Trapped My problem, my great fear... Think about it from my perspective. 